Most every week I'll ask you to watch one or more short videos like this. I'll apologize right now as I prefer to record these in a studio with a green screen. Given the state of things as the new year is starting, though, my living room will have to survive, suffice. At the end of the video will be a few brief questions that will help you reinforce your learning from this micro lecture, so please be sure to watch this with as few distractions as possible. This class was really born out of a frustration on my part when I would hear people, in particular journalists, use the word dystopian to describe any negative situation. Now obviously the class is about more than just that, but at its core this is one thing we will be investigating throughout the semester and that you will each be contemplating for yourselves. So how do we define dystopia? To start we need to step back and consider its antonym, utopia. In 1516, Sir Thomas More, at the time an advisor to Henry VIII, wrote a political satire about a theoretically ideal society he called Utopia. Out of that publication, we adopted the term to describe any imaginably perfect place. As you can see, that word has been with us in English for half a millennia. But as we can also see by taking a look at Google's Ngram tool, the word has seen increased usage in this past century. Although many people think the word utopia, U-T-O-P-I-A, means a good place, that's actually not correct. In ancient Greek, topos means place. However, that U as a prefix doesn't mean good. Rather, it means no. To say good place in ancient Greek, we would actually need to use the word utopia, which is a homophone, a word that sounds like another but has a different definition of Moore's word utopia. In ancient Greek, the morpheme EU means good. So Moore created a pun, but we've lost the joke. Moore imagined a place th that doesn't exist, a utopia, that seems like a, it's a good or even ideal place, a utopia. Regardless of what Moore intended, language follows the whims of the society that uses it. In English, we've adopted the word utopia, with a U, to refer to a potentially ideal or perfect place. We've turned it into a synonym for the biblical idea of Eden, as a paradise. But we're not here to talk about utopias, are we? We've created the word dystopia by negating that misinterpretation of Moore's title, utopia. Again, in ancient Greek, the morpheme dis means bad. We use it in English to negate the positivity of words. Euphoria is good. Dysphoria is bad. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word dystopia was coined in the 1950s to describe the opposite of a perfect place. Sometimes these bad places are more formally referred to as anti-utopias, but dystopia is the more common term. Interestingly, Jeremy Bentham, the English social reformer, tried to describe such places as cacotopias since caco means not just bad, but possibly even evil. Think of the word cacophony, the antonym of which is euphony. So in the most literal sense, our definition of dystopia is a bad place. More specifically, we have these definitions. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a dystopia is, quote, an imaginary place which is depressingly wretched and whose people lead a fearful existence whereas the Oxford English Dictionary defines it as, quote, an imaginary place or condition in which everything is as bad as possible. I don't think either of those, or any of the other variations from other dictionaries, are fully accurate. As the name of this class suggests, and as we will explore throughout the semester, while utopias may be ideal and therefore only hypothetical, I think dystopias are most definitely possible. However, I also don't think that dystopia is synonymous with the Western version of hell. I think lots of dystopias can seem pretty good on the surface. They're fine, at least for some people, as long as you don't look too closely. So far, I've focused on reality, but this is a class that will look at fictional and cinematic worlds in order to better understand our own. If you look online, you'll find plenty of lists of dystopian novels and dystopian movies. I've put together two such lists on our class website. In the literary world, We've seen dystopias described for at least 300 years. In 1726, the Irish satirist Jonathan Swift published Gulliver's Travels, a mess of a book that, although it never uses the term, explores the idea of dystopia in a number of different ways. 
However, it's not until the 20th century that we see a literary genre of dystopian fiction truly emerge. Although George Orwell's 1984, which we'll be reading beginning this week, is easily the best-known dystopian novel, it had plenty of predecessors. Perhaps most notable of all is Evgeny Zemyatin's We, published in 1921, which served as a significant influence on Orwell's writing. Orwell's novel, which was written in 1948, notice the inversion of those last two numbers, propels us into a fury of dystopian literature, which has become increasingly popular as we've moved into the 21st century. One question we will want to ask, why is there this ever-increasing interest in exploring the idea of such awful places? As we wrap up this first micro-lecture, I'd like to point out something about not just how we use these terms, but when we've used these terms. As I said, in 1818, 200 years ago, Jeremy Bentham tried to coin the term cacotopia, but it never really took off. It wasn't until just 70 years ago when we fully adopted the idea of such a wretched place and called it dystopia. Notice again the trends in how both utopia and dystopia are used in books according to Google's Ngram viewer. Except for a few blips, utopia goes largely unused for 400 years and becomes increasingly popular starting in the late 19th century and then skyrocketing in a relative sense after about 1930. Throughout this class, we will attempt to contextualize our meaning, our understanding of things, to ask what else was happening. What was happening around that time that we started to see an increase in the use of the word utopia? Well, the Great Depression, for one. As we noted, the word dystopia wasn't coined until the 1950s, and notice how it goes up steadily after that, even as the use of utopia goes up even more. Again, let's think about what else was going on. I won't run through the list, but I'm sure you can all think of your own examples. But I don't think it's any surprise that we see people thinking about and writing about both good places and bad places in increasing numbers over the past 70 years or so. One final point I'd like to make is more specific to the fictional and cinematic realms we'll be exploring. Often there's an implied overlap between the dystopian and the post-apocalyptic. However, we need to remember that one does not necessitate the other. Often in fiction and film, we see a dystopian society rise out of the ashes of an apocalypse. But that doesn't make the two terms synonymous. So that's where we're at. Over the course of the semester, as a class and as individuals, we will attempt to to develop a better definition of both the noun dystopia and its adjectival form dystopian. Both are often misused, but both are also important tools for us to understand as we attempt to live out the mission of Xavier University. A dystopia is not just a place, and I would argue that anything that employs something that can be accurately described as dystopian has the potential to become a dystopia. Our job will be to apply these terms to recognize when and where the good is being erased by the bad.